you will have to okay that to remain in the class and to get the recording later and as you may know welcome everybody good to see you again it's a combination of people that i know for many many years and people with whom i relatively have a very short relationship now at the shar and others who have been with me through our studies uh, on zoom since the beginning of the pandemic so a very complex type of relationship with many of you in this class. Let me start by sharing our PowerPoint for the day, which will help us recap where we are going. So let me just make the screen as clear for you as possible. And here we go. So as you can see, and as you know, we are at the Shar. And the Shar had asked me, or we have decided together rather, on four sessions, each looking at a different part of Israeli society. These are sessions that I have developed, I would say, in the last year, because I did study Arab-Israeli poetry earlier and with much earlier and more classic poets. I did study some religious poetry, not so much Haredi. LGBT was my first experience in this class and the new Mizrahi voices we will discuss next week. So we are today at our third session, which is our poetry about LGBT voices in Israeli poetry. And I wonder if there are people who feel less comfortable with this topic and this is why they are not joining us today or it's just a coincidence. But yes, this is a fact. Guess what? Israel has LGBTQ people, like every else, every place else in the world, and among them they are poets. Not only that, but if there is a tendency to believe that the topic of LGBT expression is something relatively new, and it's coming to the surface because we now have the pride parades and we now have discussion about all sorts of aspects of life and comfort for the LGBTQ community, it all may be true. Yet at the same time, people have been choosing their own gender choices. People have been choosing their own sexual choices and connections and loves in their lives. It always existed. The question is whether it came to the surface, whether it was okay for them to admit but this story existed. Why am I saying that? Because in my choice of the poetry that I want to share with you, there are two very modern contemporary Israeli poets, Ilan Scheinfeld and Dori Menor. Dori Menor now does not live in Israel, but he comes here very often and he continues to write in Hebrew. He is an editor. He is responsible for one of the important developments of Israeli literature in recent years outside of the LGBT community, and that is helping to bring to the surface Yiddish poetry, because he established as a very young man a connection with Avram Sutzkever that not very many Israeli-born Yag Sabras have done. And so he deserves credit for that, but also for a very explicit, beautiful poetic voice a, a, of the LGBT community. Then there are two poems by Ilan Scheinfeld that I have chosen because it will let us dip into the issue of LGBT or homosexual love is can be an important aspect of a person's life, but that does not stop other aspects in that person's life, like politics, like ideology, like where do you live in Israel? Are you part of the settlements? Are you a person who thinks that the settlements are wrong? So all this can come into the mix. And I have added at the last moment a, another poem that I'll come to if we have enough time. But I do want to go to the first, and that is Robert Friend. Why do I want to start with Robert Friend? And uh, here is his picture, and you can see that he is long gone. So he does not belong to those very contemporary young voices that I am bringing to you in the rest of the class. I want to come to Robert Friend because he had been an important person in my life without me ever having met him. There is something very special and unique that you may want to know about me and about my connection to this poet. 
I, when I teach Israeli literature, one of my major problems is what is available in translation. And when I come to a poet like Amichai, I have no problems because most of what Amichai had written is translated into English. When I come to a poet like Nathan Alterman, who is extremely important in my work, extremely important in Israeli poetry, there is hardly anything that was ever translated by Alterman into English, except for this amazing guy, Robert Friend, who translated this very few modest collection. And if you looked at my uh, Alterman collection, it's a whole shelf. And the only thing that we have in English is this. And I could not even get the book. If you are participating in my other classes, you may know a guy called Stuart, who is actually Professor Stuart Stanton, who found a copy somewhere on eBay or I don't know what, and got it and photocopied it for me and binded it for me and sent it to me. So I owe a huge debt to Robert Friend without even ever knowing that he was gay, that he wrote homosexual poetry. All I knew about him for many years is that he is the only person who translated Alterman into English and that I couldn't get a copy of the translation. That was my connection to him. I knew he was a professor of English literature in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where I now teach, but never studied there. I studied in Haifa. Haifa is my alma mater. And only when I decided to go into the LGBTQ poetry in Israel, did I discover that other part of Robert Friend, which goes to show you that in the years that he lived, it wasn't that easy to know. It wasn't that explicit. It wasn't so much out. Robert Friend is an American. He wrote his poetry in English. There are no Hebrew originals. There are translations into the Hebrew. But uh, he wrote his poetry in English. And I want to start with a later poem that appears at a time that the, a book is published with his poetry very close to his death. You can see that the uh, Bet Shalom publishing is from 1997. This is when this poem is published for the first time, and Robert Friend will die a year later. Why did he make Aliyah to Israel in the middle of his life, a relatively early in his career as a poet and as a teacher of English literature? He needed to leave the States. And you would think he, well, he got into some complication because his sec of his sexual choices, far from it. He left the US because he was a communist. And in the 50s and the 60s, when the 50s mainly, when he's a mid career kind of person, it wasn't very comfortable to be a communist gay poet in America. He happened also to be Jewish, so he makes Aliyah. And here in Israel, we can tolerate socialists and communists, especially in those early years. And I don't know that his homosexuality was very explicit at the time. So France knew. And I since then, I have read a lot about him. You may want to look him up. So look at this poem that actually gives you the ticket, if you wish, to go into this world of homosexual poetry when it is not so comfortable to discuss. A closet queen of words who hid his meaning in fashionable ironies. I now declare myself a shameless clarities and turn all my tailored sheaths into naked ease. You understand what he is doing? He is bringing his poetry out of the closet. And he is telling us that for many, many, many years, he wrote seemingly love poems to women with she's. And now finally for this edition and publishing of his books in 1997, a year before he dies, he has the courage to out his poetry 
by changing all the tailored she's into naked he's and you go straight into the culture of openness and clarity about things that was so missing in the life of homosexual people in earlier years. So the closet queen of words, look how he uses all this homosexual language, closet and queen who hid his meaning because he was using she's in fashionable ironies. You didn't discover it sounds into you like ironies. And now is the time I am declaring, I am shameless, I am out in the clear, I turn. All, every single word almost here is an outing declaration of the poetry of himself, of his body, of his love. And when does that happen? Calculate, he was born in 13. He died in 98, he is 85 years of age. And only a year before does this come out into the open. So this is an invitation into the world of the need for secrecy. And a, let us read one poem, Exorcism. There is no Hebrew for that, only the English. And it's a type of poetry. I'm just going to read it through and then stop a little bit or you will want to choose what you want to, to discuss. Because let me give you the framework of this poem before we even read it. It's a conversation of a voice that seems to be very lonely and is having, I don't know if it's a conversation or just a speaking opportunity at objects around him. There is no other person. There is no other human being. This is a conversation with objects. And the whole purpose of this presentation, if you wish, is to out these objects. He is seeking for the secret behind every object. This is a poem about outing years and years and years before the term even existed in our common vocabulary, and he is creating it. So even the word exorcism is like bringing out the devil, you know, the evil spirit from somewhere. It's a whole process of outing. I know who is scratching at the door, clock. There is no use yawning. More than boards are loose in the floor. I wasn't born this morning. Now, this is so funny because he's an American. He's writing in English. And this is such an Israeli expression. When you want to tell people I'm not that naive, you would say, Lono ayom. Or Lono etmol. I wasn't born yesterday or I wasn't born. So he's bringing even his Israeli voice. into. So you think I'm that naive? You think I'm an idiot? No, I know you guys. Beneath your gurgle water tap, I hear the water thlizzer. I know you well, barometer, and all your inner weather. Soap, you are not all leather. And cane, you are more than stick. I know who hangs on you, cloth hanger. I know you, wicked wick. I hear your silence telephone. I know your meaning so. Oh, Willy absent minded fly, I've heard your voice before. I have turned about thrice, blinded the mirror, snipped the end of my laces with the rusty scissors, trod on my shadow, strewn on my pillow, three seeds of the fern and the leaf of the willow. Be gone, augur of the candle, gene of the grinning fire. Be gone, harpy of the lintel, worn of the winding wire. Cerebrus of the threshold, run howling through the town. Imp of the ingle, shrivel, nymph of the mirror, drown. Die, demon of the cupboard. Fly, spectre of the satire. 
and die you lean clocks warden who whispers in my ear. So seeing a cousin Pip is something that he had added in the book next to this poem. When you, this very famous painting in which the painter, the name now escapes me, if somebody remembers, please remind us, when he draws a pipe and writes underneath in French, this is not a pipe. So when you I think it's Magritte. Magritte, Magritte, thank you. You're right. Thank you. So he, he added this to this first, this poem that we are reading. So it's not what you are thinking. It's not what you are seeing. This is not a pipe. This is not exorcism. This is not outing. So what is it? Those of you who listened, and I'll give you a chance to look at it again, quite a few verses, each one a separate conversation. And I wonder if there is at least a verse that catches your attention that you would like to speak about, that reveals something to you, that you can see a specific fear or worry or stress or tension or anything in the voice of this, to me, very beautifully written poem. Rachel, shall I write or I speak? Yes, you can speak, Lydia, of course. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Um, so when we talk about exorcism, I think it is also bringing everything from your, your interior out, like cleaning up your inside and, you know, like taking mm -hmm. it out. And he is, throwing away everything that you that you have and like he is trying also to come out and and tell everybody i am not who you think i am like, this, is, this is not a pipe so i this am i am like in this kind of conflict you don't know me and i somehow need to explain and express that what you see is not what I feel I am. Like you see these men all together and I am not that. But Lydia, can you not see that you are reading this into the poem because there is not one word about me, not one word about I. It's all about other objects around him. He is not mentioning himself even once. What is he doing then? by talking about the secrets of all these objects around him, not himself. He does not even mention himself. He's just describing his environment, his conversation with all the objects around him. And the title, the title, I, 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 I re relate the title to this is me also. Like, but, but it's your reading. He's not saying that. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else on that? or uh, even more so if you have a special verse that spoke to you. We can we'll look at it again if you want, because I think it deserves a second reading. So let's just go there and reading it, read it slowly and stop me if there is anything that like really deserves our attention. So exorcism and Lydia said, this is the key this means he's talking about himself and not all about all those objects. And look at immediately like a straight forward attack, accusation. I know who is scratching at the door. Cluck, there is no use yawning. More than boards are loose in the floor. I wasn't born this morning. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh well, I, I see that he's relating to the objects as external manifestations of who he is. These are all everyday objects, and he's making a declaration that things aren't always what they seem. Mm -hmm. Like, if you just look at things for their function and their surface, you don't know what their essence is really about. Mm -hmm. Look at this first verse, however. Isn't it a little bit a revelation of fears? scratching at the door, the clock, and more than boards loose in the floor. Mm -hmm. I'm not that naive. I know there is something scary around me. In the time 
uh, behind my door. More than loose boards in my floor, under my feet, it's, it's, it's shaking. Nothing around him is safe. There are sounds, the time is cheating. I hear a lot of fear in this first stanza and the wish to say, I am not afraid, I wasn't born. I, I know you well, let's go to the second. Now it's about sounds, we continue with sounds. Beneath your gurgle water tap, I hear the water slither. I know you well, barometer and all your inner weather. So there is the water tap, there is the barometer that points at something. There is more underneath. Soap, you are not all leather. I know you soap, there is something in there. Cane, you are more than stick, I love that. You're more than a stick, my cane. I know who hangs on you, clothes hanger. I know you, wicked wick. Is there more of a revelation here? In the clothing that are hanging there, is he telling us something about what is hanging in his wardrobe? Does he want us to know that there is stuff there? Is there something about other instruments, a wick, a cane? We continue with voices. I hear your silence telephone. Is he lonely? Is the phone not ringing? I know your meaning so. Oh, Willie absent-minded fly, I've heard your voice before. I've turned about twice blinded the mirror oi can he not look at the mirror does he need not to look at the mirror does he need to blind the mirror snip the end of my laces with the rusty scissors i wonder what laces Trod on my shadow, strewn on my pillow, three seeds of the fern and the leaf of the willow. Just this shadows, inability to sleep, vegetation. Be gone, auger of the candle. Now he is really sending them away. There are these scary creatures, the auger, the djinn etc in the fire in the wire in the candle they are all there even cerebrus the watchman of hell is on the threshold run hauling through the town imp of the ingles shrivel nymph of the mirror drown he wants them all dead he recognizes their unnatural supernatural powers die demon of the cupboard we are back to that Fly, specter of stairs, and die, you lean clock warden, who whispers in my ear, and Susina Puzzle Pip. Rachel, one of the saddest lines for me when you were reading it the second time is blinding my mirror, that you can't yeah. even face yourself. I find that deeply yeah. poignant. You know, the rest is, is externalized, but this is looking at yourself and not being able to accept what you see in the mirror that's and you may want to notice that most of the other things are either imaginary or sound related it's voices it's cracking it's flies and this and that and this mirror is one of the few very visual things they are the hanging clothes in the closet and there is the mirror. These are the things so difficult to look at. Jane, go ahead. And also I'm thinking of Kaddish, when, when people are uh, in, in mourning, uh, in Shabbat, cover, cover the they, mirror, and there's just deep grief here. Can't, can't even look in the mirror. There's so much grief. A life that wasn't real and authentic. So what we are looking at actually the second poem we read is a very early one. And the first poem we read is one of his very last ones. And I wanted you to feel the discrepancy, the distance 
between the years of secrecy, the years of fear, the years of inability to face yourself and the liberating end of life in the 90s toward the end of the 20th century, when you could finally say who you were and you were not afraid, maybe because he was old, maybe because he knew he was sick already and it was over. I don't know, but at least that moment came. So when we talk about Israeli homosexual poetry, it's always good to start with Robert Friend because he is not written in Hebrew, written in English by an Israeli citizen of American descent, a professor of English literature in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I think it's worth you know, honoring and mentioning. And with that, and without further ado, let us go to the more modern. So we are going to a uh, Ilan A. Uh, Schenfeld, and I like to read his poetry to you because this is our opportunity to look into the additional layers. And with his two poems, we will go not really political, but rather not just dealing with your being different because of your sexual choices, but trying to overcome other differences, other borders in between human beings. So I gave you the entrance to Ariel, a town in Judea and Samaria, occupied territories, Western Bank, whichever way you want to call it, depending on your politics. And obviously, the beloved is from there. Ilan Schoenfeld is very much Tel Aviv, probably well left of center. And what can I tell you? He falls in love with a young man who is actually a settler. And what happens then? Between my house and yours by Ilan Schoenfeld. We have never walked yet through your past. Separating my house from yours are your parents, perplexities, your own caution, and the green line. Thus, you seem to be always a hero coming down from Intifada country. Oi, can you hear the very strong Tel Aviv language? Because no settler will call Judea and Samaria Intifada country. That's Tel Aviv language thrown at the settler's language. In addition to your room, I'd most like to see the flat crock near the entrance to Ariel, where you used to go to be alone, making yourself a world removed from the world with no politics in it. So, my beloved, you told me when probably you first found out about yourself and probably couldn't share that you would go to this place, to the stone by the entrance of your town, Ariel, to be alone, not because of politics, because of who you were. I need to see that stone. I need to go there. I never acknowledged the untamed land you grew up in, that boulder-strewn countryside magic to you, to me, has always been merely occupied territory. Suddenly, in loving you, I find myself nostalgic for the landscapes of your childhood. It's hard to believe it could ever happen. But beyond all the killing and the blood we two here together are willing to apply our love to the landscape of the past, perhaps, in fact, there is no fairer thing we can do. Okay, there is no fairer thing we can do. Where does this poem find you, my friends? You need to cross several borders here in order to understand this friendship, this love. Talk about cross crossing borders. Can you put it up again, please, Rachel? Oh, yeah, of course. This is here for us to look at as long as you want, Kamuvan, and you have it, of course, in the text that I have sent you. Bevakasha. 
and we can look at the Ivrit, by the way, because this one, of course, was written in Ivrit. And since quite a few of you have some Hebrew, let me read it for, to you so that you can feel the original. The separating my house from yours are your parents' perplexities, but Timahon is so much stronger. Zehirutcha, your caution, and the green line. Lechen tamid atanir ali ke gibor yored mir toch arzot ha intifada. Thus, you seem to me always a hero coming down from Intifada country. Yes, Rabbi, did you want to comment about some other verse when you asked me to put it back on the screen? No, it's a very com it's a very complex poem with multiple themes woven into one, and I just needed to reread it. Um, the f the f I, I won't comment yet. I've just wanted to point out I've never heard from the perspective of others that the Yehuda of Ashamram would be referred to as Intifada country. That's something new to me. I'm, l I'm learning today. Come live in Tel Aviv, or at least visit, or come to the demonstrations in Tel Aviv, and you will hear that language. So this is it, why it is such an important poem for us to read, because look at what Ilan Sheinfeld, the Tel Aviv voice, is saying. It's hard to believe it could ever happen. He, the Tel Aviv guy, cannot believe it about himself. He can accept his homosexuality. He cannot. Oh, it's hard for him to accept that he fell in love with a settler from Intifada land. And now that he comes to terms with it, he says, it's hard to believe it could ever happen. But beyond all the killing and the blood, we two here together are willing to apply our love to the landscape of the past. Perhaps, in fact, there is no fairer thing we can do. And you are looking at this and you think, look at what we have here in this very clear, absolutely left wing voice that is saying in no simpler words, love is love. And it can conquer anything. And I wouldn't have believed that about me. But I need to reach out to your home. I need to see the stone by which you went alone at the entrance to Ariel. I'm, I'm coming to love the landscapes of your childhood, which for me were occupied territory, territory and intifada land, because I love you. The two of us maybe can somehow develop a, a language of love to the landscapes that we share. A very complex poem. And let me just give it another a chance. If Eddie, yeah, Jen, I was looking for more hands. Go I, ahead. I was so and, and, moved. Oh, sorry. I was so moved by this. It's a, a poem about ultimate peace. And you know, it it might have homosexual overtones or undertones. When I read that ultimate poem about peace, if we can love enough and long for the landscapes of their landscapes, and, and it's not ours and theirs and occupation and other, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jen. Edna, please unmute. And no. you, Edna, no. can you tilt your camera a little bit because we only see the top of your head? Mm -hmm. Just if you can, if it's a problem, then let it be. Oh, okay, maybe okay. this. Okay. Yeah, this is so, good. For whatever reason, this really heavy, heavy, and very difficult poem, the two words that really catch me each time I see one, one line or another is occupied territories. Mm -hmm. It's not only the physical occupied territories, it's the emotional ones too. So it's just the blend of the two of them make it like, you know, like a fist to fist really hard. Because physically, we know that we, there is an occupied territory, but between you and I, there is also 
a territory that is occupied. A, a different type, and we can relate to the landscape. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Lydia, go ahead. Yeah, um, I also um, hear the word hero, like they consider themselves heroes if they're doing this, because they know it's not the normal, they know other people won't accept uh, politically and religiously, uh, on top of every the, the fact that they are gay, they are also dealing with everybody who will say, how can you go to Ariel? Or how can you come out from Ariel going to that land, Tel Aviv? So they are, they are heroes. They are heroes. And if everybody- Just by reaching out to each other, just by being able to be the two of us here together, just that in spite yes. of everything because if you you could bring here all the noises in the house of robert friend are nothing compared to the noises around this couple the political the social the religious the environment the tel aviv the judea and samaria and whatever all that noise around them and they are in the midst of that trying to reach out and understand each other's landscape. And maybe if everybody was like that, maybe there would be peace. <laughs> so maybe we need LGBT love to bring peace. But let's think about it. Okay. And let me do Rachel, I have a question for you. Sure. Do you think that there could be such a poem written from the other side? Or maybe is there a poem because what this poem is, is a man who is almost as equally surprised that he has fallen in love with somebody as he is surprised with who that person's political leanings are or his home or his childhood youth. And it's a very Tel Aviv secular left perspective that all the starting assumptions are coming from i can't believe it the craziest thing in the world what i thought was impossible i fell in love not only with you but you're a settler yeah and <laughs> it's it's almost a very one side i wonder would there be or is there i can't believe it i fell in love not oh, only yeah. with a man but a secular man from tel aviv Probably there is. I can look for it. <laughs> you know, there must be. Listen, there must be. You just have to to look. Uh, because you know. the overt the overt critique here is a critique of the settlers as much as it is the the surprise of falling in love. Of himself, I did not believe about myself that I will be able to fall in love with a person whose home is occupied territory for me and he loves it so much. Right. There is self-critique here as well, not just a critique of the settlers. This is very deep looking in the mirror that Frank could not do earlier. Elan can, and he looks at the mirror at himself. I could not believe that about myself. Who am I not to be able to believe that about myself? that politics and territory will mean more to me than love and then love conquered. Yes, Gloria, please. You know, Rachel, I don't know why I'm, I'm reminded of your, um, your son, Uri, giving speeches about addressing the humanity of the people that seem to be your adversaries. You know, it's not Uri, it's Ophir, it's Yossi's son. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I forgot okay. the name. Oh, we, we have different sons in the family. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but it um, but this is what it reminds me of that when you break it down into Adam Le Chavero, mm -hmm. there it, I agree with Jan, you know, that it's very much a um, a plea for seeing the differences and being able to have a rapprochement between them. And if mm -hmm. you see people as other human beings rather than political adversaries, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. And there is another one with another shade of this among the Ilan Shadefeld poetry. And I will take you now to Dori Menor uh, and then to that poem that I have added. So this is a, a poem called A Letter 
to the frontline soldier in Hebron by Ilan Sheffield. I know if I don't know if it's the same man who is now in the, the, the settler who is now in the military and holding the line in Hebron, if it's another lover from a different period, but the the issues are similar here. You are in the army, you are doing all that military stuff, and I just am longing for you and wanting you back, etc. And now let's go to Dori Menor because this is a, to me, not only to me, a very famous poem. A, it, it really, it, it's relatively new and it acquired a lot of echo. And I'd like to ask for a reader to just read through it and for me to discuss it later. So I'd like to do a, a little bit of the Ivrit Gloria, are you good to read this? Are the letters big enough on the screen for you? Yeah, my my progressive glasses are strong enough. <laughs> okay, so that's good. I'm a, doing a little bit. The title is White Roses, Savrodim Levanim. A, those of you who study with me in my regular online courses will know already about our translators, Heather Silverman and Michael Bonin, one from Boston and the other from Palo Alto who work with me to translate poems that are not a uh, translated by professional translators and since I am in touch with Dori Menor I sent him the translator the translation and he accepted it and thanked us for it and allowed us to use it so uh, this will have two slides as you will see uh, I just want you to be aware it's it's sort of a uh, long but I want for us to read just a little bit of the Ivrit and then the English. Mitachat la korkar shil gana atzmaut, utzeret li velo becharikat blamim subaro levana, gil sheshesre, kehut chorechet, venoheg ba bemabat mashmim. Let us go to the English. Below the limestone of Independence Park, a white Subaru stops for me, no screeching brakes. 16 years old, burning apathy. He was driving it with an indifferent gaze. A guy, not at his peak age, but a guy. I remember he claimed his name was Rotem. I was Lior, pronounced with a murky penultimate accent. I pondered. The things that are likely to happen are the same things that would happen anyway. I climbed into the Subaru. His shirt was a mess, a mesh shirt, a caveman, limp bodied, large, hairy. I noticed the bulge in his pants. I think he said trowel. I knew I had to take it in my mouth, and I did. A yellow light dripped from the street lamp directly at his loins. It was freezing cold. Although it was a wet July, Kafavi, once called it divine. Go figure. I don't remember what my reward was in this exchange. Not nine measures. Oh, not nine measures of kindness for sure. Maybe a little bruise on what until that day had been strained. The wheel turned in front of us with no passion, sweat dripped and odors floated but the sun didn't rise until the act was over. Maybe this is why you didn't yet go to sleep. When I came back home later, you had sneaked into your room. You did not ask if he was the first and you did not want to know what his part was and what was mine and what kind of an end awaited me. You knew all that already anyway. Wordlessly, we had another Oedipal night. You didn't wonder, you didn't ask if the one who left me was dearer to me than you. In our rooms, you dreamed in alto, I in baritone on the limestone ridge, under which no drama that took place today, just a straight continuation to the child you covered, the child who swelled from seed and warmth and covered himself every night with a poisonous layer. This is how he went to graze in foreign fields, fat holding onto his loins so they wouldn't pop out from his bagpipe. And if there is a sign left of his childhood, 
it is for sure an irreversible sign. Maybe the blood rushing up to his face, maybe a childish eye left open. Look at him. There is a hatch torn open in him now, a breach that will not be closed as long as he can breathe. I remember how early the next day you found two white roses on the sheet, two milky roses whose scent is carved forever in my nostrils and forever it will be carved, like a tattoo, a line of shame in my gaze and a note of a song inside the soul. I brought you beautiful flowers for Shabbat. I brought you flowers. Are you still mad, mom? Hmm. Yeah, I know. We'll read this poem for the last lines. Because with all the detailed description of the loveless intercourse, this is not Ilan Sheinfeld and his settler loved one. This is something totally different. Early fearful experiences, hiding, not pleasant, no love, shame, anger, young age, and the wish somehow to maintain his mother's love in spite of everything. And you do not know what the answer is, but the beauty, among other things, in this poem is that Dori Menor, who is an interesting person and also a literary critique, a translator, is making a very clear allusion to a very well-known poem by Lea Goldberg, which is called To a Portrait of My Mother. Your portrait is so peaceful, you are other, a bit proud and embarrassed at being my mother accompanying me with yielding smile and the rear and never asking who. You never wondered, never raged when I came daily demanding give me. With your own hands you brought me everything only because I am me. And today you remember more than I do my childhood sorrows. Then you already understood when your grown daughter would come to you she would bring her grief that has grown too. Yes, I will come broken and not ask how you are. I will not cry in your arms nor whisper, Mama, you will know how he who left me was dearer to me than you are, and you won't ask who. So what Dori Menor is doing in his poem about the white roses, is attaching himself to a literary icon and to a literary text that many of us who are lovers of literature know in Israel and that the, the inability to bridge over a relationship that is solid yet cannot allow the existence of all the secrets that needs some sort of commitment that will not ask who oh, that will not ask why, that will accept and still love. And what he is saying, if you could accept Leah Goldberg's inability for regular relationship, she was not homosexual. She just could not create what other people may call normal relationships. And her mother accepted everything. And he said, if you can accept Leah Goldberg, can you accept me as well? Can my mother be like Leah Goldberg's mother? Because Leah Goldberg died a year before her mother and when her mother took care of her until she died. And when the mother died, the only thing she wanted the grave on her tombstone was Imashe Leah Goldberg, the mother of Leah Goldberg. So the call of Dori Menor here is really desperate. It's saying, if you can accept that, can you accept us as well? Because it's not very different. Okay. And now, Mark, I cannot give you exactly what you had asked for, but I may get a little bit closer to that issue of who accepts what. 
and a you read also narcissus by dory Manor, which is beautiful and heather and michael done a great job translating it i i want to read you the most recent poem that was published about i don't know a couple of weeks before we studied it less than a year ago in my other poetry classes and this is a a poem written by a young homosexual man who lives in a relationship they are raising children his name is segal the first name escapes me what i will uh, come to it in a moment i will remember i sh i assure you and we now have in our political system this person called avi maoz who is clearly out there not only against homosexual relationship but also very strongly for treatment to change people into not being homosexual, against supporting any program or any education in the school system. So we have our poet writing a poem, Le Avi Maoz Tirshom Ani Homo. To Avi Maoz, write it down, I'm a homo, homosexual. Why is it interesting for me to show you this poem today with the translation? Because it is in conversation with an earlier poem, not by Leah Goldberg, but by Mahmoud Darwish, a Palestinian poet born and raised in Israel, who had left later. And he writes one of his early poems to the Israeli audience where he says, record, I'm an Arab. And my identity card is number 50,000. I have eight children and like, <laughs> and the ninth is coming after the summer. Will you be angry? Record, I'm an Arab, etc., etc. And a, our poet, Weingarten Segal, and I still cannot remember the first name, is writing the following. It says Daniel. Daniel, okay, yeah. Thank you. I remember the Segal Weingarten, the two last names, and not the first. Sorry, Rachel, before you begin, I have a question on Hebrew nuance. Is the phrase homo in Ivrit a pejorative? Yes, people use it as a curse word. Okay. Okay. Write it down, I'm a homo. Remove your sandals from your feet before you speak of my love. Write it down. On the night my daughters were created in a foreign land, haters of humankind voted in the Knesset against their very creation. At that hour, I was recruited to the army. And people like you tried to tear the Israeli uniform off my back, but could not. Write it down, I'm a proud teacher of male and female human beings, teaching them to recognize the wings of their spirits, to love male and female human beings, to raise their voices and demand their rights, to see the kingdom correctly and to walk to their tents, to act even when a divine voice is heard. You follow the majority as long as you don't follow the many to the evil. Write it down, justice, justice shall you pursue. Write it down, love your fellow as yourself. Write it down, the stranger who reside with you shall be to you as your citizen. You shall love each one as yourself. Write it down, the halakha follows the school of Hillel. Write it down, ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, neither in measures of length, weight, or quality, quantity. Write it down, common decency came before Torah. Write it down, Jerusalem was destroyed only because they educated cases on the basis of Torah law and did not go beyond the letter of the law. Write it down, why was it destroyed from there was wanton hatred in it. So here is a text, not exactly what you had asked for, Mark, but a text that has a conversation that is totally political in this case. Totally political. 
It's about rulings and committees and passing of directives and laws in Israel's recent government with people like Avi Maoz and others who will limit the rights of same gender couples to have families to raise children. A Doron and his partner, Doron is Weingarten and he took the name Segal of his partner. His partner's mother, the best Doron's mother-in-law is a student in our literature classes, Jill Segal, you may have seen her, Gloria or Edna. And when we did this session, she read the English translations for her son-in-law. So this is maybe not the greatest poetry. It's not as beautiful than The Exorcist by David Friend. It's not as challenging maybe with the intricacies of love across many borders, but it's very recent, it's very contemporary, and it addresses the issues right now. When I started preparing these sessions, one of my regrets that I haven't done yet is not looking at what you were asking for, Mark, the other side, but looking for female LGBTQ poetry, which I haven't found yet on a, on a level that I would like to teach, but it may be coming in the next year. So let me stop here and see if you have any comments or questions regarding what we have done. Because, mm -hmm. if not, yeah, anybody? Becky, go ahead. Hi. I have a I have a, a a statement or a remark about the other poem about the settlers. The concept of settler is very very different because a settler doesn't mean anything. In other words, I can be a settler who lives in Kiryat Arb. I can be a settler who lives in Ariel. I can be a settler who lives in in Eli. And everybody is different. There is no such thing as a settler. I remember when I when I when 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 I when my daughters my sons got married. I have one daughter-in-law who's a Tunisian, one daughter-in-law who's a Moroccan. My mother came and she said to me, "My goodness, they're marrying sisters. They don't look anything alike." But they're Sfardiyot, and she had no concept of what a Sfardiya was. And for her, they all looked alike. There was no difference. And the concept of a settler, when he talks about it, it's as though you can just move everybody together and make and mess it all into. And that's not true. That's not a true about any human being. Everybody is not different. Sure everybody has their group. identity. Okay, they are never the same. And when not you on. when you other people, one of the phenomena of othering other people is by meshing them together and i as a secular person get that a lot like people will be shocked when i quote a torah verse i like how can you why do you do that you are secular kind of thing so i totally understand you becky <laughs> and just like you cannot mesh all settlers and i oftentimes joke because you know in my line of work what can i tell you as a Tel Aviv secular person, some of my best friends are settlers <laughs> from, from Efrat and the Gush and Beit El and other places. And I work with Pardes, so obviously most of the faculty there are people who, who, who live in a flattened environment. I know what you're saying, totally. I know but it's, you're... But, but it, also goes, it also goes on the other extreme. When you talk about Tel Aviv, my son went to yeshiva there. Okay, I can't consider that a secular yeshiva. It wasn't. My my daughter in law's parents live in Tel Aviv. They're not secular. In other words, you also can't brand the whole idea of Tel Aviv and say Tel Aviv is secular and Tel Aviv is you know politically and da 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 da. And you know it's not true. And I think that that that's part of the problem. That the, the minute we can't see people as individuals, we're in trouble. This is why we read this poetry, and this is why it's so important to to listen to Ilan Schoenfeld discover that about himself, that he could have not perceived, and yet it happened, and the settler became a human being, and he is in love with him. Okay, so that's exactly the point of the poetry we are reading, and thank you for your comment, Becky. Anybody else? I just... I just have an observation from the first poem that we read with the exorcism. I think that any artist 
uses their creativity to sublimate some of the ideas and the things that the, the painful things that they live with in a in an artistic covert way until they're re ready, ready to be yeah. transparent. And, and poetry is such a beautiful medium for that to happen so that a person can live with themselves until they're ready to, you know, shed the other seven mm. veils. Okay, so yeah, we are closing Lydia in these very moments. And so that. Thank you so much. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. Please come back next week when we read some of the most contemporary Mizrahi voices. And I will sort of frame it in some more classical, older Mizrahi poetry that I taught in the past. We will focus on the contemporary, but I will give some framework and context as we go into it. Thank you very much. Rachel, I mentioned this in, in closing to say thank you to you. I mentioned this two weeks ago. Um, we have a variety of classes that we're offering at the Shah Hashemayim online learning program, and they're excellent. There's something about poetry, or maybe it's something about your pedagogy, that throughout the week it lingers, and it's a very it's interesting. I'm still I'm still thinking why this is. Maybe it's the nature of poetry that there's multiple interpretations to every line. But I want to let you know that, again, this last week, I was walking around with Haredi poetry in my mind. <laughs> and this is uh, an incredible gift that you have. This is not a one hour class. This is a seven day lingering. <laughs> I'm glad to know that. And uh, it's incredible. I want to thank you very much. And I uh, invite everybody to come back next week for uh, once again yeah, on Thursday, months. Montreal, 2 p.m. time, Israel, 9 p.m. time or wherever else you may be tuning in for, for Rachel's fourth and uh, final class. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you to Daraba. I will stop the recording now.